Hello, I'm Julia Cohen. I am co-founder and managing director of Plastic Pollution Coalition. And thank you for joining this month's webinar, uh, part of our global series, bringing our community together to highlight the latest issues, information and resources to help stop the planetary plastic pollution crisis. Welcome to our June webinar entitled Toxic Tours, Virtually Experiencing the Impact of Plastic Production on Frontline Communities. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, and regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. All right, now we have four poll questions to get a sense of who's joining us today. Um, let's move to poll question number one about where you are joining us from. Most folks are in Europe and North Asia, interestingly. Um, or am I not scrolling down enough? Oh no, North America, I was gonna say that's a little strange. So, um, but uh, not unexpected. What best describes the sector in which you work? Majority of us today are in the nonprofit NGO world followed by um, other and government and policy then education um, and small percentage in corporation business and others. All right, moving along. Do you live close to, or have you ever visited any of the following? Well, this poll question is very specific to today's webinar topic. Majority of us all live near polluted river, lake, creek, other waterway, followed by recycling facility, fossil fuel extraction, more than a quarter of us, um, and also composting facilities. So that's pretty powerful. Um, and 21% near a petrochemical plant. Wow. Thank you guys. Okay. And then last but not least, have you and or someone you know had their health impact by air or water pollution and or Okay, we're about 60-40 here with 61% saying yes. So thank you all so much for sharing and really powerful to know a little bit more about everybody who's here. So thank you so much. So without further ado, um, I wanna introduce today's webinar moderator, Caro Lina Gonzalez. Caro is the global communications lead for the Breakthrough from Plastic Movement. She's an advocate and communicator with a commitment to social and environmental justice, whose accomplishments include co-creating a storytelling foundation in a country with a high level of government surveillance and limited free speech, um, inspiring a movie that premiered at the Miami Film Festival and receiving the Effective Advocate Award by Amnesty International. Welcome, Carl. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Julia, and welcome everyone. So today we'll take you on a tour to key areas in the United States to hear directly from frontline activists protecting their communities from the impacts of fossil fuel extraction and plastic production. First, I want to take a moment to say that the Toxic Tour project was inspired by environmental justice groups who have been doing toxic tours in their communities for decades. It is thanks to their expertise that the concept of the platform came into being Frontline groups around the world have been leading this digital project and producing their own stories. So let's take a moment and, and take a quick look. So we hope that short video gives you a feeling of what the Toxic Tour project is about. Um, but to dive more into details, I want to introduce Erica Jackson, who will be giving us a working demonstration on how the Toxic Tour platform works. 
Erica is manager of community outreach and support at Frag Tracker Alliance and leads the Frag Tracker outreach efforts and supports the mapping and data needs of communities impacted by oil and gas development. Utilizing Frag Tracker's online platform, outreach programs, and mapping and data expertise, Erica engages the public in fracking issues and provides resources to support local organization and campaigns. Welcome, Erica. Thank you, Caro. Um, as we kind of heard from the introductory polls, the expansion of the petrochemical industry is negatively impacting all of us and really the entire planet. Um, but as the industry pushes consumers' reliance on plastics, worsening the climate crisis, their facilities are disproportionately harming a smaller group of people, and that is those that are living directly fence line of these sites. So the toxic tour you will be learning about today will give you access to the voices and leadership of the communities most impacted from being exposed to oil spills, air pollution, and other toxics. And these communities are raising their voices and fighting back for their right to have access to clean water, air, uh, clean air, and clean soil. So my role on this project was to design and implement the mapping portion, um, which you'll hear about a bit in a bit in the upcoming uh, short video. Um, this was a unique project for me in, in many ways, and I really enjoyed working on it. Um, and unlike some of the other maps that I've made in, in my role at Frack Tracker, uh, for this one, we used crowdsourcing tools so that the groups were able to, um, that participated in the tours were able to have more agency over what they wanted to map and um, gather their own data. And this also allowed us to combat the lack of data transparency that is kind of common across the globe. So we're going to show a short video that um, shows you the Toxic Tour platform. How does the Toxic Tour platform work? On the homepage, we have an overview video. You can click at the buttons on the bottom to go to any region. In Asia, we have locations in India, Bangladesh, and Taiwan. In Europe, we have locations in Scotland and Belgium. In Africa, we have locations in Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa. In the United States, we have locations in California, Texas, Louisiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And in Latin America, we have a location in Argentina. You can start the tour in any region. I'll click on Mundra. Each location has a tagline and top line video that allows you to have an immediate idea of what's going on. You can then go to overview where you can learn more through text and the map, which shows locations of the petrochemical industry, polluted areas, and where the videos were shot. Every location has different chapters. In this location, you can see grazing land, dunes, and seawater. I'll click on grazing land and I can watch a different video um, on that topic. You can add captions by clicking the CC button for different languages. You can also change the language of the entire platform by going to the languages button at the top. Once you've toured the location, you can go to the action tab. Here you can learn more about the group on the ground that participated in the filming and you're invited to share it online or go to their website. And you can also go directly to the next stop on the tour. At any time, you can click Toxic Tours at the top and go back to the world view. On the Take Action page, you can share the tour on social media, support the Global Treaty on Plastics, sign a letter that calls on banks to stop funding climate chaos, and learn more about different campaigns to stop the build out of petrochemical facilities around the world. We hope to continue growing this tour so you can see environmental justice groups are welcome to email us to add their location to the map. Please take time to explore the platform, share and take action. Okay, so that gives you kind of a little bit of an overview but definitely after this, check it out. Um, on your own because there's so much to explore. 
Uh, but to start our, you know, this version of the tour, um, we're going to start in southwestern Pennsylvania, actually just about in that hour or so south of where I am right now, um, where you will be given a regional overview by an impacted resident, someone who I've um, had the pleasure of taking an in-person toxic tour with and learned so much from. So please join me in welcoming field organizer with Clean Air Council, Lois Bauer Bjornsson. Thank you so much, Erica. Good evening, everybody, and good morning in some places. Um, as we look at the map, I wanted to let you know that I live in the most heavily uh, fracked county in, in southwestern Pennsylvania, Washington County. My home is completely encompassed by oil and gas facilities, well pads. Um, in a one to three mile radius, there's 25 well pads around me. Um, I can see well pads out of my bedroom window uh, when they're in the fracking process, not to mention my children can see it out of their bedroom windows as well. There's also hundreds of, of well pads in, uh, in the radius next to my home and, and surrounding communities. I'm actually looking at the video and I see the petrochemical hub, so I'm going to switch gears here <laughs> and I apologize. Um, the petrochemical hub, what we're looking at is an 800 acre facility. Um, this was built on an old zinc plant um, and it was given the largest tax break ever in the state of Pennsylvania. It was uh, 1.6 billion. Shell was in turn going to take natural gas from my region and make plastics here. So the, the fracking industry um, and the state's air permit allows this plant to emit more than 500 tons of volatile organic compounds also known as VOCs a year. And this is more than any facility in Southwestern Pennsylvania. And second, and the second most of any facility in our state. There will be plastic pellets or noodles released into the Ohio River and the river supplies water for thousands of people, drinking water and bathing water, et cetera. Shell has already had sulfuric acid spills due to, to uh, faulty flange or fitting during the processing and the building of the plant. Local residents reported a rotten egg odor for days. And as you know, the CDC, or you, you may know, the CDC considers sulfuric acid a corrosive substance that can cause damage to skin, eyes, teeth, and lungs, and can harm workers if exposed high enough and long enough. The Shell Cracker plant is an hour from my home. So you may think, well, why, why are you interested in this? Um, well, um, all four of my children either attended or will be attending a uh, performing arts school there that is just miles from the petrochemical hub. And all of the fracking will increase to a thousand additional wells already in our area. So we're fracking for plastics and that really should not be our goal. Um, just to back up a tiny little bit and give you uh, a little bit of information of some of the things that have happened um, to our air and our water and our land. And it's, this is really an unsure um, way of life to be living all the time. And along with the chemicals that are released into the air and our water and all of our surrounding life forces, um, these chemicals are in our body. So my family and five other families um, were part of a pilot study called Fracture of the Body and Burden of Proof with award-winning reporter Christina Marusic with Environmental Health News. So over a few months, we were, we were personal air monitors, our urine was tested, and our water was tested in our homes. Some of the chemicals in all of our bodies were formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, mandelic acid, hippocuric acid, and naphthalene. My third son has the highest levels of mandelic and hippocuric acid in his body. And I have the highest level of naphthalene in my body. So these are industrial chemicals. The only source for these chemicals is the oil and gas industry that have been introduced into our region. In addition to the health harms such as nosebleeds, skin rashes, exasperated eczema, Lyme's disease due to warming of the climate that has been directly um, correlated to the use of fossil fuels is the issue of the oil and gas waste. Radioactive drill cuttings, mud, brine, and injection wells that is used for the drill water and in the mud bring with it a host of terrible consequences, including and not limited to leachate being pumped from municipal landfills into public water sources. The leachate, which is a watery substance from trash, was piped directly into our Monongahela River, where my family and other families is our drinking water source. The municipality, municipality excuse me, all the uh, authority determined 
that the landfill was sending more than double the amount of leachate allowed to be treated in the plant, which according to court documents was contaminated with diesel fuel, I can't pronounce this one, phenos, possible carcinogens and other chemicals used in the gas drilling and fracking processes. Since the industry is allowed to label their waste residual instead of hazmat, it is allowed to dump in local municipal landfills. Local municipal landfills cannot accept this waste. They have no idea how to handle it or even discharge of it. So the reason that it is labeled residual instead of hazmat is that this would cost the industry time and money. So I think I covered just about some of the things that go on where I live. And these are just tips of the iceberg. You know, the, around my home even, we have a compressor station down the road. We have pipelines. We have a man camp, which is a facility that houses workers. We have, um, I'm just thinking, so, uh, a training camp also, pig launchers, and again, more pipelines. And we have one that is 75 feet on our property. So, and again, all of this infrastructure does not make for a, a positive um, well-being and way of life. We moved here about 17 years ago to raise four children at the time. And so they um, unfortunately have raised up here being surrounded by fracking and everything that comes with it. And it hasn't all been positive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luis, um, for sharing your story, resisting the petrochemical buildout in your community. And we definitely appreciate your, your time and local advocacy. Our next stop in our toxic tour, take us to the other side of the United States, to Southern California, more specifically Wilmington, Carson, and West Long Beach, situated on the ancestral homelands of the Tonga people. These communities are forced to breathe toxic emissions from the drilling, transportation, and refining of crude oil. To learn more from a local resident, we have Diego Mayen, member of East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice and a local resident. Welcome, Diego. Hey, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Carol, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Diego Mayen. Uh, my gender pronouns are he, him. And I think I wanted to start by just sharing an experience that I had to do this morning that I think not uh, a lot of other communities have to do um, in the morning. I woke up to calls from uh, people uh, telling me to call 1-800-CUT-SMOG because the refinery that is about four miles away from my house uh, was having a very huge flare in the morning, so much so that even though the refinery is four miles away, it looked like it was kind of just happening over like the the ridges of the houses um, around my house since the refinery is like kind of uh, to like my left side, like in front of me. Um, but yeah, I could see the the huge flare over and I think that really just shows how like our community is really impacted at a lot of the the production of like plastic and the burning of like the fossil fuel um, industry. You know, it affects the way that we're able to move within our own communities. Like I've been on toxic tours on bikes where people have like fainted from the air quality and how like rough it is here. Um, I've given toxic tours and helped give toxic tour to people who are not from our community who experience like headaches in 10 to 20 minutes of being outside um, in our in our neighborhoods in the areas that we live. Um, you know, it also affected part of like my schooling when I was younger. Sometimes uh, we wouldn't be allowed to go outside for like outings, I guess, uh, because of the the air quality was so bad. And teachers would tell me that like, oh, you know, we can't really head outside right now uh it's better to have lunch like indoors or try to be indoors if you can because the air quality is so bad um and you know the oil and gas industry really does like affect us at a lot of different like stages in our life it affects how much we're able to be mobile in our communities it affects you know how much rest we're able to get you know living next to a refinery not only comes with air pollution but also things like sound pollution and light pollution the refinery is very like bright at night because it has a bunch of lights um around the refinery uh we also live like near the port so there are like trains that pass by and some uh people have stated that uh living next to like a, a rail yard like their house shakes like it's an earthquake but it's just the the rail like moving a uh, cargo from like the port to like other places for more diesel trucks to to be picked up and for more oil to be extracted um, so I just really wanted to uplift that, like a lot of the 
the issues that surround oil and oil and gas also tie into a lot of different um, issues. You know, it affects uh, like mobility, it affects our rest, it affects how uh, like much we're able to go and how far we are able to travel because, um, you know, I grew up and thankfully I don't have asthma, but uh, I grew up with a lot of my friends having asthma. Um, and yeah, it's just really been like a, the oil and gas industry has really had like a hold on uh, a big like portion of my life. And it just seems like I can't uh, really escape it. So I would really like urge people to really like uh, look into these issues and look like for community groups that are, you know, affected by this and, you know, our, our residents and people who live in these communities are the experts in, you know, what's happening to us. So I really wanted to thank, uh, you know, everyone uh, that helped put on the webinar today and all the pan panelists as well. So I'll pass it back uh, to Caro. Thank you, Diego. Uh, so thank you both for sharing your stories. We recognize that it's, it's definitely not easy to share uh, how your communities have been directly impacted by the petrochemical buildup, and we value and are inspired by your local activism. We'll now begin the Q&A section of today's webinar. As Julia mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is a reminder that projects like the Toxic Tour are an opportunity to center the discussion around the human experience and how often these abstract and complex issues impact the lives of our friends and our neighbors. So this is an opportunity to hear directly from some of the leaders around the changes they want to see happening in their communities. So please keep that in mind when you are submitting your questions. Okay, so we're getting a question from Luis. Thank you so much for your incredible, uh, incredible presentation. What was the outcome of the health pilot test? This might be happening um, somewhere else. What is the action plan? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, the outcome that we hope that will happen from this is that we have a larger study with hundreds, if not thousands of people in state to state regions. Um, the study was also sent to our state legislators. And there's actually, when you click on um, the link and you look up the study, it is the responses from all the legislators. So whether they paid attention to the study or they didn't, or they poo-pooed it away or said it wasn't true, all of their reaction is in there. So our hope is to still move forward and have a larger study so that we have more participants so that you know, industry can't say things like, oh, it's just this, this few people and they're a little crazy <laughs> and it's not true. And, you know, they got it from pumping gas into their cars and things like that. So that, that is the goal. And um, I have, I've spoken with Christina just recently and that as far as I know is still moving forward. So it's really just about a larger organization or med medical organization picking this up and moving forward with the study. Thank you, Luis, appreciate that. Thank you. So we have a comment from Holly of Falvi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Just a comment, we had an ethanol plant in our city that was shut down after many years. Um, we have another question here. Um, there is a petrochemical facility planned in my community. The company is promising jobs and some people think it will be a good thing how to convince them. Diego, I wonder if you if you have thoughts to share there. Yeah, I could share. Uh, I will say that it's definitely not um, going to be easy, but I think there are a lot of resources that can show kind of like what a refinery and like a petrochemical industry like facility does to uh, communities. You know, we've heard from like different panelists today that, you know, have shown. Um, so I think it's really just like trying to to get them to understand that um, while the promise of jobs is something that is very important given like, uh, you know, we are in a pandemic and the current like state of the economy and everything. Um, in the long run, I think it'll hurt more people than it'll like help just because the emissions are gonna not only affect the people there, but they're also traveling like through the air. And then also like making sure that they understand that like this industry is going to affect the lives of people. And it's also gonna change the way that you know, the air even feels in your neighborhood, you know, I am able to tell the difference when I go to somewhere that has a lot more like green space and like cleaner air. Um, it feels very like crisp is the way I would always define it. And then when I come back here, it's just very like 
heavy and dense. Um, so I would really uh, try to urge people to understand that in the long run, these uh, industries are just going to harm and cause like uh, issues for the people that are living there and the people that might move there or, you know, kids that are growing up and developing, uh, developing in like very toxic air uh, could lead to a lot of issues. Like I said, like I know a lot of people with asthma, but it could also present itself in like something even more serious like cancer because of all the emissions. Thank you, Diego. Um, yeah, and I, I think something that as people explore the, the toxic tourist platform, um, one, one thing that you will notice is definitely the common themes like that are connecting people around the world on these issues. So, and jobs is definitely one where we see it over and over again in the stories where jobs were promised um, and they never came or they came at a pretty high cost. Um, so that's something that uh, those stories are there. Or what's the uh, kind of breaking that myth of, of of those opportunities and what it really means for the for the communities? But it's also connected to what Diego was saying during his remarks about the need for just transitions for uh, communities most impacted by the petrochemical build out. So the next question I have here, I'm going to redirect to Erica. How can I be able to contribute to the toxic tour projects from Nairobi, Kenya? Um, great question. So um, there is, on the Toxic Tours website on the top right, it says, uh, I believe, take action. And then on that page, you scroll all the way to the bottom and there's an email um, where you can email. You could also just put your email on the chat and I can take note of it. Um, but we have a stop in Kenya in Turkana County, I believe. Um, but of course, it doesn't mean we can't have more stops in Kenya. Um, we have multiple stops in, in many countries. So, um, but yeah, there's a there's an email that you could add. I think that would be great to connect. Thank you, Erica. So the next question I'm gonna uh, share for both Diego and Luis in case uh, if, if anyone wants some thoughts. What communication, if any, does the industry attempt with your community? How would you describe it? Well, initially, when industry comes to town, they're your friends, and they, you know, give five thousand dollars to the school or the baseball team or the football team, or they build a stadium, or you know, depending on the economic side of the community, is how much money industry will put into town. Um, industry has been known to put more money into more affluent towns than poorer towns, so. Initially, people think that's great, and you know they'll fix the roads after they destroy them, which they shouldn't be doing anyway. Um, so initially, it's it's a honeymoon period that I call it, and um, you know people are very happy with them. They're they're throwing money around, and everything's great, and they're promising money for people and farmers, and you know um, people that are building the petrochemical hub. They have a job for five years, and those type of things. So um, they 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 court the unions locally. Um, to you know the, the builders trades and things like that and the pipe fitters and, and so on and so forth. So initially it's really good and then um, and then sort of it's not, you know, um, sometimes you can't even reach people. You, you can't even, you know, they'll say, oh call this number if something happens, if anything happens, and you call that number and you can't reach anybody. Um, one of the, the biggest uh, sort of issues that we have is some of the compressor stations, we've been told that they have an automatic shutoff that is controlled from literally um, another part of our county. So there was been a few fires at some of these compressor stations and there was no automatic shut off. So it's those type of things that initially it's a honeymoon period and then you're just sort of divorced. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope that explains it. <laughs> and not a happy divorce. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. Diego, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I've had um, or similar experiences kind of where um, well, actually not necessarily. I think a uh, conversation with like the industry and polluters have been very like far in between and they're mostly usually uh, always negative, at least like uh, recently I know some of the people from East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice uh, gave public comment um, to protest one of the uh, a bill that is going to basically decide whether or not we want an incinerator to be like in our community and the way that the forum is set up is just like it's public comment period and then after that the industry gets a chance to speak and then they usually always discredit whatever uh, we have to say or like 
say that like we don't have like enough like uh, evidence or scientific evidence to like back up uh, whatever statements and then they'll show some sort of like data that isn't representative of the communities that you know they're going to affect um, so yeah communication hasn't been uh, the greatest but I think they do at least ha have like some sort of sense of who like uh, some like community groups are environmental groups are so I think it's very good that uh, you know we're instilling some sort of like fear that they feel the need to have to like come and combat what we're saying because otherwise you know I think uh, no one in their right mind would ever side with uh, with polluters over community. Thank you Diego. Um, we have a question that goes kind of on a similar theme, but it's related to local rep local representatives. It says, how do your representatives react to your experiences? So I wonder if uh, any of you wants to talk a little bit about that. Um, I can speak from representatives viewpoint. I'm sure Diego can also, um, but normally the representatives, um, you know, they're in bed with the industry. They welcome them with open arms. And so when you go and, uh, tell them of the issues or problem that you know you or neighbors or other community members may be having they, they you know they're really initially first concerned but nothing is ever really done about it um our senator that we're supposed to report to is the third highest paid senator from oil and gas um and i'd like to you know uh, mimic what diego said um that, you know after the initial niceness of industry and then you come up against them and hit them with real facts and real studies they poo poo it away and say that those aren't true facts and those aren't real studies. And they, you know, pull, pull these facts and studies from other you know, parts of the world that have nothing to do with your community. Um, but so the, what's unfortunate is that most of the local officials um, are, ha, have been um, wined and dined with, you know, with industry prior to the community even knowing that they were coming into town. Um, that's what happened with our, the petrochemical hub. Um, in Beaver County, um, they were taken out on a helicopter ride to see the sites where it was going to be. It's pretty sad. Thank you, Luis. All right, so we're going to move on to another question that I'm going to uh, direct to Erica. The president is encouraging the petrochemical companies to pump more oil from inactive wells. They have the permits, in quotes. Are these type of wells in are are these the type of wells in Pennsylvania? If so, is there any way to urge the president to be aware of this issue? Um, I would say um, there are wells in Pennsylvania that have already been. There's a lot of wells in Pennsylvania that have been permitted, they but they have not yet been drilled or they have not yet been fracked. So there's um, more that could be extracted from them. There's also a practice, uh, not so much common in Pennsylvania, but around um, enhanced oil recovery. It's a big thing in California. And that's something that we're seeing like with these proposals to capture carbon, um, like carbon sequestration. And then actually, unfortunately, the oil and gas industry has plans to use that carbon to, um, after they capture it to, uh, for enhanced oil recovery to get even more oil and gas. Um, in terms of pressuring the president, I think campaigns to pressure at the federal level are maybe more relevant to things to oil and gas development happening on public land or oil and gas development approved by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and so in Pennsylvania, I would say there are more campaigns like at the state level or the local level. And I think like projects like the Toxic Tour really demonstrate the power of local organizers and, and local action. So I think that's a good, a good way to, um, a good place to devote energy and resources and time. Um, and I know right now with the price of gas, even though, you know, Pennsylvania is, it's, it's you know, not, we're not fracking for gas for your car, um, but you know it's a crazy time right now with gas prices and in the war. And there's all of this kind of propaganda and talk about um, needing to extract more. But but really, you know, it's the oil and gas companies that are controlling these prices and and you know prioritizing their profit instead of and you know regular people um, suffering because of that. So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I'd be happy to follow up with you if, if it doesn't. 
Thank you, Erica. So moving on to different kinds of questions. Um, I have here a couple of questions. One is specifically for Diego. Um, I'm trying to find it. But it was, yeah, can you share a bit about the demographic of the community? Can you share a bit about the role, the role of systemic racism in sacrifice zones? And there is also uh, connected to uh, specifically uh, a question that says, for people who don't understand how are BIPOC, meaning Black, Indigenous, people of color communities disproportionately impacted by plastic pollution? Um, yeah, so I can, I can speak a little to that, um, at least uh, for the demographic in West Long Beach, I believe it is about like 97% uh, percent, uh, BIPOC people. And, you know, I would say that we're affected at pretty much a lot of the different stages of, of oil production. You know, we have extraction within our communities. We have uh, like the production and refining of the oil, sometimes the refining of the products is, you know, we also live to one of the largest uh, poor complexes on the West Coast. So we also have, you know, uh, the issue of like goods being transported and moved across uh, through our communities with like diesel truck emissions, which uh, we have the 710 uh, freeway here in Long Beach, which gives about like a way to 60,000 uh, diesel truck, uh, like ones that pull like the shipping containers, shipping containers from the port um, every day. And then we also have another major freeway, which connects to like a lot of different parts of LA, which is the 405. Um, which also just seats like a lot of different traffic. Um, and I think it really is just like uh, environmental racism. And, you know, because we are a BIPOC community it plays a very big part of it. Um, I don't think I've ever seen like a freeway or refinery built in a more like affluent community or a community that's predominantly more like white people. And I think that's very uh, intentional and industry has like an idea the way I think about it or the way that it was explained to me is that one of the reasons why industry puts like these huge, um, you know, freeways, refineries, like incinerators next to communities of colors, because there's a lot of um, different things limiting us as like uh, BIPOC people in society. Um, you know, there's issues of like language barriers. When my parents came here, I had to like translate a lot of uh, things growing up when I was younger. Um, there's also the fear of like, as well, like and I'll use my parents as an example, like not wanting to draw like attention from the police or like, big law um like companies do to like you know a uh, status of like uh their status of citizenship like within the country so i think it's like they're very intentional with the way that they put uh these things next to communities because they think that you know we won't like speak up or say anything um and it's very hard for us to move i saw one of the questions um and the q a panel was also about like how do we feel when people say um, just like move away. Um, and I think that's really like, a really dumb response and an educated response just because, you know, it's not that simple. Like even the housing market within our own communities are like rising to like uh, like half a million dollars or a million dollars for, you know, houses that are near and in these communities that are disproportionately affected. And I also think that that shows that uh, moving is more like treating a symptom and not like the root cause of it. Um, you know, I've also been in interviews where people asked me, like, if I ever thought about moving. And usually my answer is no. I think I would rather stay and try to advocate for the uh, communities and try to use my voice to, you know, make sure that future communities and the community now doesn't have to deal with, like, refinery pollution and all of that. Um, so I think that's a, it's a very dumb response. And I think that's, like, not uh, an answer to the issue because uh, the bigger issue is, like, plays into a lot of like systemic issues, systemic racism, as well as like lack of resources for uh, BIPOC communities. Thank you, Diego, for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I also wanna give an opportunity to Lois to, to speak a little bit about that question. Um, the question on the, pan, on the Q and A box was, what is your response to those who say that people who experience these problems from the petrochemical industry should move location or homes? So I'll just give you a little bit of family history. My family's been here since the beginning of our constitution. So that's over 200 years or you know more. So we were here, um, they weren't. Um, even though I come from a part of the state that does extraction, um, that doesn't mean that we should be pushed away from our ancestral homes, or our families, or our jobs, our children's schools, um, or their grandparents for that matter. That is not a solution. Even if you could afford to move, where do you go? 
you just get further and further away from it. So maybe it isn't out your bedroom window, but it's down the street. And, you know, air doesn't live in a bubble and neither does water. And frankly, neither does land as we're learning from, you know, the landfill. So it's not the solution to move. The solution is, is to keep things further away from people, to have industry be accountable and to have entire communities possibly even given some sort of respite and then industry needs to adhere to stricter standards for clean air and clean water and they should not be allowed to pollute in these communities so basically that was a long-winded answer but we were here first not them thank you for sharing that um, the other question is very connected to what you were just sharing. Um, so I, I would love for, to hear briefly from, from you both. Um, what does environmental justice mean to you? What would it look like? Wow. Um, like if I could wave a magic wand, um, you know, we, we would transition to clean or renewable energy and we wouldn't have people being harmed um, and we would have... Um, great union jobs building clean and renewable energy and um you know just living in a different type of, of of mind thinking and frame thought instead of digging our heels in and, and you know saying silly things like i was in harrisburg last week and i heard a legislator say, coal and i was like wow <laughs> you know this this constant old way of thinking it is just doing none of us any good. So it's about moving forward and embracing those changes instead of digging our heels in till the last second. Um, and if you really look at, at the larger oil and gas companies, they're already investing in, in renewable energy now. So they know it's a matter of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Diego, any, any thoughts on your end? And also, um, and then we're going to invite you both to do uh, any final remarks that we're not covered, that you want to share that we're not covered during the questions. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, I think just to answer the question, I think when I think about environmental justice now, it has really become uh, what comes to mind first is community. I think in an ideal world, like we would all be coexisting with like uh, nature, you know, we would be coexisting with the people who uh, you know, we're on this land before us, you know, in Long Beach it is uh, the Tongva people. And I think I would, in a perfect world, there would be like now it's extraction um, and more focused on like renewable sustainability, not just for like energy, but also, you know, and the way that we eat and in the way that we like uh, package things and things like that. So I think in a perfect world, there'd be a lot more green and a lot more of coexisting with like uh, nature and the things that we're here before us and not like extracting and taking that role of like humans are at like the top of whatever like structure there is because you know there is no structure we should all just be coexisting together. Thank you Diego. Luis any final remarks from you? Um, sure I, I have a, a saying that you know people may like or appreciate or not um, but I think that you know we, we, we may not find the exact results that we want, but people have to hear us when, they, when we speak. And I think the more that we speak and the more that people's stories are told, then the more that things cannot be ignored. And then again, we're not just this crazy activists over there that are terrorists. And you know, there's a whole bunch of us and there's, there's more than a whole bunch of us. So I think that's really what it is about. And I think that it can be very difficult for people to sort of keep, you know, trudging along and telling their stories and, and making um, people listen, but that's really essentially what needs to happen. And then pretty soon we can't be ignored anymore. Erica, any final words from you? Um, I would just say um, working on this project was really a privilege and I really learned so much. And I remember there was a moment when some of the videos came in where I, you know, it's, it's so obvious, but it would just really hit me just how, you know, it's the same few multinational corporations and all over the globe um, with the same playbook throughout space, but also time. And, um, 
you know, the same tactics kind of rooted in colonialism and extraction and, and the way that these countries, these co companies are able to control our natural resources to exert control over communities. But um, there are so many more communities than there are and residents organizing than there are companies. Um, so it's really powerful to see what everyone is working on. And I think one thing I learned was that um, the petrochemical industry was really disrupting people's ways of life and their traditional livelihoods. And in those ways of life and traditional livelihoods are like all the solutions and answers that we need that people have been living zero waste lifestyles. They have been living in harmony with the land. Um, they have been using energy sustainably. So it was also just really inspiring to see like, you know, the answers are, are right there. So definitely encourage everyone to, to see that for themselves. Thank you all so much for sharing your remarks with us today. Uh, today. And we invite you to visit more locations and learn more about the project at toxictours.org. And please also share the platform with your with your networks. I know there was some questions related to legal actions and other things people can do. So I'm just gonna share briefly before we, we close here. Um, so if you wanna take different actions, there are definitely things that you can do at the local, national and global level. At the local level, you can support frontline communities directly and you can visit each location on the platform and learn more about each organization and how to support them. At the national level, what you can do is to support the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. This piece of, of, this piece of federal legislation seeks to meaningfully address the plastic pollution crisis by shifting their responsibility for waste management and recycling to the manufacturers of packaging, prohibiting plastic waste from being shipped overseas, expanding the definition of toxic chemicals and prohibiting such toxic chemicals from being included in products covered by the legislation and more. There is a link in the chat where you can find out more about how to support this piece of landmark legislation and it's also included in the toxic tour action page. Finally, at the global level, you can sign in support for a legally binding global plastic treaty that addresses pollution caused by plastic across its life cycle. And again, you can find more about all these actions by visiting toxictours.org slash take dash action. Thank you to the Plastic Pollution Coalition for hosting this conversation. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'm now gonna turn it over to Julia to wrap up things. Thank you, Caro. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, please save the date for our next webinar on Wednesday, July 27th. We will be um, uh, discussing the challenges and opportunities of making your business plastic free with a few of our business coalition members um, who will be talking about their challenges, their struggles and, and what they've done. And it should be super interesting as well. Um, and we welcome you to connect with us on social media to learn more if you haven't already and uh, to join the coalition, it is free. You can join as an individual, a business, a nonprofit, um, and you know, follow us and share. And here are our tags and all that fun stuff. And then you can also um, um, fill out the survey that we'll be sending out after this. We really appreciate your feedback um, to help us improve these webinars and you know, we welcome suggestions for other topics and speakers. Um, and we try and promote and support um, our coalition members. So, Another reason to join. Thank you again, everyone for joining. And thank you also to our coalition member groups and partners who sh shared this webinar with their communities and networks. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar on July 27th. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.